that was so cool. Uh, it's going to be difficult to follow it up, but I'll do my best. So I'm Jenny Smith. If you guys don't recognize me, it's probably because I'm somewhat new to Casper. I just started learning about Casper about a year ago when I began grad school at UC Santa Barbara. So I'm super excited to be here and tell you guys about what we're doing to try to make a new readout for optical M kids using the RF sock. So first I'll talk a little bit just about our science schools. So unlike a lot of people here, we're actually not doing radio astronomy. But I'll explain why we still care about radio astronomy techniques in the coming slides. So my lab is focused on finding exoplanets. The dream for our lab is to be able to directly image an exoplanet that looks somewhat like Earth. And we like using MKIDS for this because it can detect photon energy, time, and space all at once. So another thing I just want to highlight, because it'll be important in the readout characterization, is that we need the MKIDS to read out super fast. And that's important for a lot of time domain astronomy, but it's also really important for this technique called adaptive optics. So how that works is telescopes can probe the atmospheric perturbations, telescopes that are on the ground, and they can correct for perturbations in the atmosphere caused by different heat pockets. And then there's actually actuators that can deform the mirror of the telescope to undo that effect and create this more clear picture down here. But the time resolution is important there because the atmosphere is moving. So the feedback loop needs to happen on sort of kilohertz time scales in order to do well. And currently, people have science cameras that integrate over long times, and they have a secondary camera that has a slightly different optical path that updates more frequently. But it would be cool if we could combine those two things into one so that there'd be no path difference. So MKIDs have the ability to do that because they can do the science camera aspect and the fast readout all in one device. So MKID stands for Microwave Kinetic Inductance Detector. Adrian talked about these previously. It's pretty much the exact same thing, but we're actually reading out optical photons. So the way that it works, this is sort of like the equivalent model here. I think the scale will cut off, but it's okay. We don't really need the words. This is an equivalent MKID circuit, and it's a superconducting LC resonator. So what happens is a photon comes in, strikes the inductor, and then it breaks Cooper pairs, which changes the inductor of the inductance. And that ends up changing the resonance frequency of the whole circuit. So there's an amplitude shift here, as well as a frequency shift. And then if you're sending in a microwave probe tone at that resonance frequency, you can see that phase will shift as well. So this is the signal that will actually end up reading out, just the phase. So our lab does sort of like full stack MKID development. We do everything from modeling and designing the detectors to fabricating them, characterizing the devices, building the readout, deploying them at the telescope, collecting the science data, and analyzing it. So there's a lot going on, but never a dull moment. So this is sort of from the fabrication step. We make these kilopixel large arrays. And here you can see there's five different microwave feed lines going into this device. And each microwave feed line has about 2,000 of those superconducting resonators on it. So if you zoom into this device, you can see this picture here, how the MPs are sort of laid out next to each other. This is slightly more magnified, and this is even more magnified. So this picture here represents this model circuit here. And I've labeled the inductor and capacitor portions. So this is what the actual signal that we want to detect looks like. This is just a phase time stream for a single resonator. So when a photon comes in, it creates this pulse that you see here. And the whole decay time is about 200 microseconds. But we want to read them out closer to one or two microsecond frequency so that we can resolve this fast rising edge here. And over here, you can see how different color photons create different phase pulses. So this is of a red lower energy photon. And this larger phase changed from a higher energy blue photon. So the point here is that MKIDs are capable of single photon counting. The zero read noise, because that's just the way the detectors are designed. And we can determine photon energy, location, and arrival time virtually simultaneously. So now I'll tell you a little bit about how these detector physics inform the readout characterizations. So this is sort of a canonical transmission spectrum for MKIDs on a single microwave feed line. So you can see they're all at different resonance frequencies. And here I've just zoomed in on two resonators that might be adjacent to each other in frequency space. So what happens when a photon hits one of these things is that it shifts down. And because of these large learning and tails, you can have this resonator crosstalk problem. So even though it's only shifting by 20 to 100 kilohertz, we want to keep them spaced at about 2 megahertz to avoid this problem. So given that we're sending in tones from 4 to 8 gigahertz, and they need to be spaced by 2 megahertz, that sets the maximum MKIDs per feed line at 2048. When we do the fabrication step, we try to keep them more or less evenly spaced. 
but that's sort of, yeah, difficult to do. So a readout really needs to be able to account for the M kids being anywhere in the band. And then in our final channelization, we only need 200 kilohertz to resolve that pulse that I showed on the previous slide. So now I'll talk a little bit about what we're planning for the Gen 3 readout. So first, currently we have just a large lookup table that stores the information for how to compute the superposition of tones that we're sending in to probe the M kids. So that comes here, it's played out by the DAX. It goes into an IF4 that mixes it into the four to eight gigahertz range. That was created by our collaborators at Fermilab. Goes into the cryostat, probes the M kids, and comes back and is collected by the ADCs. So we do actually heavily care about DAX. We need DAX. So at that point, we need to channelize the tone. So there's at most 20, 48 of them on a single microwave feed line. We have to move all those down to zero hertz, low pass filter, and down sample before we can do our downstream processing. At that point, we have an IAQ value for each of those resonators, each of those pixels. It's all the same, same thing. We take the arctan of that to convert to phase, and then we can convert, we can filter that phase time stream, which I showed in the previous slide, that pulse, and detect actual photons. So we're working towards an architecture where we can actually implement tone tracking, which Adrian talked a little bit about and the Smurf group has already implemented. So in that sense, we'll actually have to have a feedback loop with megahertz update rates to track that tone as it's moving when it gets hit by the photons. It is tricky, yes. <laughs> so currently, we do our canalization in two stages, and we're probably going to propagate this architecture to the Gen 3 readout. So the reason why we have to do that is because if you just do a large FFT in the onset, you sacrifice timing resolution. So in order to be able to resolve as close as we can to when the photon hit the detector, we can't do a super large FFT. Because the bin sample rate goes down, the more bins there are. So what we try to do is an oversampled polyphase filter bank is the first stage. So Mitch talked about this a lot in his talk yesterday, but essentially the goal here is that no matter where a tone is, it can pass through one of these bins without being attenuated. So then after that, we have a direct digital down conversion step. So this might be um, the output of a single bin from the polyphase filter bank, and then the direct digital down conversion multiplies this and rotates it to zero hertz, and then down samples it, and low pass filters it. So another thing I want to highlight is it's possible to have two tones in the initial bin, so we also need to account for that. So for example, this bin here might have to get hit by two different direct digital down conversions, one that will convert the first tone to a small bin, and the other one that will convert the second tone to a small bin. So after that's been done, we get this phase time stream. So this gray line here, this is just phase versus time, shows what we would get without any sort of filtering. And then in the lab, before we actually deploy this, we shine intermediate light photons on the detectors, and we form this sort of average pulse for every single detector. And then we stack those, overlay them, average them, and we fit an exponential, and we use that to compute an optimal filter for every single different end kit. So that gets loaded into the firmware and applied, and then we get this black line here, which is a much cleaner signal. So we set the threshold for four sigma below the baseline, and then these are the detected photons here, these red points. So going forward, we are hoping to migrate our design from Roach 2s to the RF SOC. And one of the main reasons why we want to do that is because of the low power. So we're shooting to fly the new MCID readout on a balloon mission, September 2020. So in the upper atmosphere, there's not very much air, so you can't convectively cool your electronics. So we're concerned about the heat load, and also if it's too power hungry, we're going to have to fly a bunch of additional batteries in the balloon, which is also difficult. So to try to make MKIDs more appropriate for space flight, we need to migrate to the RF SOC. So here's some of the tools we're thinking about using. We've also been thinking about Casper tools and potentially integrating our firmware to Casper after we develop it. So yeah, I think I'll end there. And I just want to say thank you to some of our sponsors. I mentioned Fermilab designed our IF board. Xilinx donated one of our RF socks. NASA funds like basically the whole lab. And uh, obviously, you all at Casper have been so helpful this whole conference. And we've really gotten so much good information here and are super excited to work with you all going forward. Yeah. Sorry. Somebody else asked a question. <laughs> so, in the first five exoplanets, we can roll with 
We are, yes. Some of our proposals are targeting those missions. I'll just ask, so um, is, do you see SB uh, any new to CASPA, or did you get used to it? So we have a current okay. Gen 2 MCID readout that was built only using CASPA, CASPA tools on the Roach 2 by the grad student before me. Okay. So now we are updating that to the RF SOC, but our timeline might be a little bit sooner than all the tools are going to get ported to RF SOC, so we might not actually use CASPA tools for Gen 3, but potentially we could port our tools to CASPA after that. I, I'm just interested in Google. I didn't know that UCSD was very active in CASPA. I'm not sure I think the previous grad student was very active in CASPA, yeah. Do you know that person's name? Matt Strader. He's a monk now, actually, so he's kind of gone dark. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Let's thank all our speakers for this.